Welcome, fellow plebs. My name is Sean, and this is Tribunus Plebis. All right, welcome everybody to the Tribunus Plebis podcast. It's good to be with you again. First thing I want to talk about today is something that is near and dear to the heart of Tribunus Plebis, the union vote at an Amazon warehouse in Alabama. And then we will hit the situation in Texas. The Amazon union vote is not near and dear to our hearts here because we work in that warehouse or because we work for Amazon. I work in a totally different industry up here in Massachusetts, in fact. It's near and dear to us because we are, at our core, pro-union, pro-labor, and pro-worker, and we just want to see workers assert their rights, fight for themselves, their comrades, and their families, and unionizing is the surest and clearest path to doing that. Any individual workers versus the Goliath that is Amazon, which is being led by rabidly anti-union billionaire asshole Jeff Bezos, is a joke. And just to bring a very real-world example to magnify just how large the power differential between a massive multinational monstrosity like Amazon and its workers is, think about this. Outside of the Bessemer facility, which is the one being organized, there exists a stoplight that is on public land. This means that union organizers and supporters can legally congregate there, which they've been doing. Now, at this light, they can hold placards and signs, they can hand out literature, and they can just, you know, simply talk to employees at the stoplight, all of which they've been doing. Then an odd thing happened. The red light suddenly got very short, and there was no time to engage with anyone at that light. Of course, the organizers thought this was quite odd, so they looked into it. It turned out, after many denials by Amazon, that Amazon had, in fact, exerted its power to convince the county itself to change the duration of that light. Amazon was able to actually alter the safe flow of traffic around their facility to prevent union organizers from speaking with its employees. How crazy is that? They actually had the traffic lights changed. Amazon versus one or even a hundred workers is basically invincible. But a thousand workers versus Amazon with the profits generated from the massive regional warehouse the workers control at risk? Now that is a fight, and it's a fight that the workers can win. So, how did all of this animosity start? Well, it would probably really need to be traced back to Amazon's creation, I guess. But I think that we can safely ascribe much of the recent fervor to organize Amazon locations to the outbreak of the coronavirus in this country. With the various shutdowns, store closings, and people either working from home or being more or less stuck in their houses, online sales skyrocketed for the entirety of the past year. Yep, we are about a full year from the first real lockdowns and the first wave of workers being sent home, either to work from there or just being laid off and fired. So Amazon hired a lot of people, something like 400,000 people which is a pretty remarkable number if you stop and think about it for a second. Nearly a half a million people, and they did it in just the first nine months of last year. Now, over the past year, Amazon and Bezos have skyrocketed into the stratosphere as far as wealth and power go. Amazon itself set a profit record for the third quarter of last year, which left the entire fourth quarter to just pad the stats with. And that fourth quarter includes Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and the entire rest of the fall and early winter holidays that include Christmas itself. Bezos saw his net worth balloon by $75 billion over that same period. And this is from Bloomberg via Business Insider. Quote, Bloomberg provides some helpful comparisons for Bezos' net worth which is 2.7 million times the median U.S. household income. For example, 
His wealth is equal to almost 8% of all home sales in the U.S. His gains this year alone are greater than the annual GDP of Costa Rica or Lithuania. End quote. Not only that, but Amazon warehouses have seen their workers driven to an unconscionable degree by corporate numbers chasing and a focus on so-called efficiency over all else, including the well-being of their employees and their safety. The stories of these base inhumanities are so numerous that it would be difficult to even count them. The unrelenting drive of the computers that the associates use to put orders together is just one aspect, but it does cast a pretty bright light on the overall situation. And while I am starting this little narrative with the outbreak of COVID and the lockdowns, this entire situation of Amazon abusing its employees begins well before COVID and can be easily stretched back to right when Amazon began hiring so-called unskilled labor. And it just continues to get worse. Amazon, along with many other companies, my own included, have gamified the jobs of their employees. The employee can see a real-time readout of where they are on their current project, but also how it compares to where others are. And these time jobs are ruthless, forcing the employee to be constantly moving, walking upwards of 10 miles per day in an Amazon warehouse, constantly scanning, and constantly under pressure. A countdown on your screen shows how much time you have to perform the task at hand. Eight seconds to pick that thing up and scan it. Drop it? Tough shit. Now you're behind. Work harder. And if you fall behind, everyone can see. Nothing like some collective shame to motivate your wage slaves. Am I right? Need to use the restroom? Well, the computer sent you to the other side of the warehouse. Now you're 200 yards away from the nearest bathroom. The timer's counting, man. You need to get that toothpaste and scan it, but you're about to piss in your pants. You're falling behind just doing the math in your head. Your countdown is red. You're behind. Your name is dropping on the giant scoreboard that everybody can see. So, you'll just piss in your water bottle, you decide. And then you do it. And that's not an uncommon story either, because if you keep falling behind, you can lose pay, hours, or even be fired. Let alone the effects of that corporate-induced worker shame crap I just mentioned. Even lunch breaks are affected. In the warehouse, your computer drives you to work right up until your lunch starts and quite often leaves you across the entire warehouse from the break rooms. So you lose valuable minutes just walking from your station to the break room, minutes which you have to account for at the end of your break just to get back to your spot on time. And if you add in a very much needed bathroom break, then your lunch and break time could be cut in half. So I mean... Really, none of these things should really strike us as surprising, right? The mega corporation that exercises monopsony power in so many of its warehouse areas and damn near monopolies in online sales and web hosting services, it's treating its employees like garbage. It, it shouldn't be what we'd call shocking. It's really pretty much exactly what would be predicted if anyone actually thought about this for more than one minute. So given that we know that Amazon, just by the definition of their existence right now, treats its employees like garbage, I do want to talk about another thing here. This fight is happening in Alabama. And Alabama is one of the most strident anti-union states in this country. In fact, it's a so-called right-to-work state. Right-to-work laws are basically laws which were written specifically to destroy collective bargaining in the states which implemented them. Basically what they say is that if you're a worker at a unionized plant and you don't join the union, you get all of the benefits that that union bargained for without paying them. And as a side note, right-to-work came directly from ALEC, A-L-E-C the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is a pretty far-right, conservative lobbying group and think tank. ALEC is really the launching pad for pretty much every anti-worker piece of legislation that has been passed in this country since the 1970s. When you see a senator or someone else stand in front of a crowd and talk about how the minimum wage is bad or how right-to-work laws are good or voter ID laws or deregulation of industry, that's all Alec owning that politician's soul 
and using them as a mouthpiece. So anyway, sorry about that sidetrack, but it's important to understand where these politicians and talking heads actually get the horrific, inhumane ideas that they espouse on national TV and in the marble halls of government. Okay, so to get back on track, this is happening in Alabama. The warehouse itself is in Bessemer, which is near Birmingham. And I really think we should make a real note of this and take stock of what's happening. Historically, Alabama has been mostly a non-union workforce, and the city was really built around railroads and the steel industry, which was, to repeat myself, I guess, generally non-union and competed with unionized northern steel manufacturers. However, the Birmingham area, including the city itself, was the epicenter of multiple labor movements stretching from the mid and late 1800s right into the interwar and post-World War II eras. In an area fraught with racial issues for its entire existence, black and white workers and even undocumented immigrants historically found causes to fight together as collective units, including several mass strikes which devolved into actual armed conflict between the workers and the capitalist owners of those corporations. As an example, we could look at 1908, the year of massive coal field strikes that involved over 20,000 workers, most of whom were black. The strike was eventually broken by August of that year, but not before it had devolved into periodic armed gun battles and suffered from the bosses actively trying to inflame racial prejudices amongst the striking workers. These strikes and organizing efforts continued until after the World Wars, and they were routinely met with companymen, posses, and so-called detectives firing machine guns into crowds and strike camps. In particular, U.S. Steel ran a relatively radical union shop in the area for many years as well. And I only mention this stuff to say that Alabama was not always as anti-union as they currently are. And, you know, I guess the state itself was always against unions, but the workers very much were not against them. This is probably an important distinction that I should make. So the best comparison I can think of to make here trying to put this Amazon vote into historical perspective, is the General Motors strike that spanned for 45 days and lasted from the end of 1934 into 1935, and which we will cover in an upcoming episode for sure. GM workers staged a sit-in strike to demand recognition of their joining the United Auto Workers Union. The strike at a plant in Flint, Michigan, was really the main flashpoint of this movement as it slowed down production in numerous other plants and cities which relied on the products produced in that Flint facility. The issues that the GM workers faced might even sound familiar to you if you listen to this point. Poor work conditions, strenuous productivity goals, and immoral chasing of efficiency over employee welfare and safety. And we might take a moment here to consider what the Amazon workers are fighting for. Sure, wages are important, but you rarely even see them mention pay. In Alabama, they are starting at just over $15, more than double the minimum wage. What they tend to focus on is the basic inhumanity of their predicament. The lack of bathroom breaks, the insane production goals, the safety issues, including COVID-related failures. The same sorts of things that the auto workers were fighting for almost 100 years ago in Michigan. The overall GM strike ground car production to a halt and eventually led to the UAW recognition and made General Motors one of the best companies to work for in the country for several decades, even earning the moniker of Generous Motors along the way. A union win in the Bessemer Amazon facility would very likely result in much better work conditions for its workers, something which we can all get behind, right? Well, not Amazon. Amazon is not getting behind it. Workers at the facility are bombarded daily with texts, posters, and flyers. Anti-union messages are plastered all over the facility. Tacked to walls, taped to windows, flashing on monitors. Even the inside of the bathroom stalls are littered with anti-union propaganda. Amazon even created a fancy anti-labor website and promotes it to its workers. Consistent. Long, 
required meetings are held to propagandize anti-union sentiment as well. The Bezos-led anti-union messaging was the same thing that GM workers of yesteryear would have been exposed to. Things like, why pay dues when we already pay you money? Why lose your individual voice and put somebody between you and your bosses? And both of those are fundamentally dumb. But the next one is really the doozy, and it's the one a worker will hear the most often when they begin to organize for a union drive. The bosses will start talking about, we are a family here. And they'll start talking about how no outsider will care about you as much as your family does, and so on. And one of the interesting things with this deceptive messaging is just how barely legal these statements tend to be as I saw firsthand when my workplace tried to go union a couple years ago. The anti-union loser from corporate came in and started saying things that certainly insinuated things in a way that bordered on illegality. So when I asked if he was asserting that X meant Y, he was very quick to say like, oh, no, 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 no. I did not mean that at all. In fact, that would be illegal of me to do that. And when I said that it certainly sounded like he was insinuating those things, he very quickly repeated the same nonsense about how, no, of course he wasn't implying that, and we should let him rephrase it so it's more legal sounding and so on. But it was clearly meant to mislead people and to insinuate those illegal statements without actually saying them directly. As a further sharpening of the point of how far these companies will go, in 2019, Elon Musk, famed Tesla dork and anti-union boss man, was ruled by a judge to have illegally interfered with a union drive at one of his Tesla facilities with some tweets and public comments. These people absolutely will lie and use illegal tactics to deprive you of your voice. These companies pay anti-union consultants tens of millions of dollars just to make sure that they don't have to pay you hundreds or thousands. Frankly, at the base level, all of this is just sick. Your employer is not your family. It's not even your friend. It is literally an exploitive situation where you, if you are a worker, are on the shit end of the exchange. This simple concept is important to keep in mind if you ever find yourself in this situation. Your family is at home. Your job is just something you do to earn money to feed your family. Your family will always be there. Your employer will fire you tomorrow to please faceless shareholders or simply to meet some bonus criteria for the C-suite ghouls. The corporate oligarchs will fight you every step of the way. Amazon fought the initial card signing but lost. Then they fought to prevent mail-in voting and tried to force the employees to vote over four days on site in the parking lot of the facility. Bezos and his hatchet men even went as far as firing a union organizer named Chris Smalls in New Jersey for daring to try to organize his fellow workers in order to have some say in their own lives. But the workers in Alabama fought on. And thankfully, the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB, ruled against them, and starting back on February 8th and continuing for almost two months, the workers will be able to vote by mail and let the will of those workers be done. And we here at Tribunus Plebe stand and speak in solidarity with the Amazon workers trying to better their lives and with any worker at any company who tries to do the same. All right, what do we want to talk about next? Gina Carano? I mean, she got fired for just being a shitty person, really. Not really something I care about other than being, well, you know, not really upset about. Personally, I'd be happy if we all just let her fade into rightful obscurity and not continue to amplify her fake martyrdom. We have Amazon and Tesla workers being fired by two of the wealthiest human beings to ever exist in the entire world. And we are going to spend a lot of time talking about a rich, untalented actress getting fired for being a shitty person? Please. Chris Smalls, the man who was fired by Amazon, and Richard Ortiz, who was fired by Tesla and later forced to be rehired by the previously mentioned Dork Musk, both of who were fired for organizing their fellow workers, 
deserve a thousand percent more coverage than a person who can't stop posting hurtful messages towards already vulnerable groups. So let's pay more attention to people like Chris Smalls and Richard Ortiz and a little less attention to edgelord shit posters like Carano. Agreed? Agreed. All right, let's talk about the great frigid state of Texas. But before we go on, actually, residents of Texas are currently suffering. Let's not forget that. Let's not take glee in that. Let's not attack them as they suffer and die. Focus all of your scorn on the corporate and political scumbags that allowed this to happen, okay? All right, so Texas froze. And because it froze, over 4 million homes lost electrical power while the temperature dropped into single digits. People actually died. At least 30 people died because of the failures of libertarian, free market ideology, all of which could have been avoided. The primary problem, other than just the general anti-government, anti-regulation, so-called freedom-loving politics that are prevalent in the state, and I don't want to dismiss all of that because those beliefs are really the driving force behind all of the shit I'm about to list, but I don't have time to fully dig through all that right now. So let's just focus on what happened. Texas has a unique power grid. Every other state belongs to one of two so-called interconnects, the Eastern Interconnect and the Western Interconnect. In fact, if you draw a line up the zigzag of state borders above the Western edge of that little flat section on, at the top of Texas, that's where the dividing line is between these two grids. Texas decided not to be interconnected and instead has their own nearly entirely independent power grid system. And this is important to the story. Texas did this to, you know, keep those damn coastal elites from interfering or something equally as stupid. So Texas is the lone state which does this. They say it was done for independence, but really it was about profits, a theme which will run deep throughout this story. The reason why this choice is so important is that if, say, I don't know, maybe Texas freezes over because of cold weather, okay? Let's just try to imagine that happening and work through this. So if it freezes, as crazy as that sounds, and Texas cannot generate power anymore, then they're just dead in the water without power. For a state that is part of the interconnect system, if they can't generate power locally, other states can send power through the grid and assist them. This is why they are interconnected, for mutual aid and redundancy. So instead of being able to draw power from other states, Texas saw 4.4 million people go without power in freezing temperatures for days on end. Many thousands are still without power even into the time that I am recording this. People were left to live in their cars or trying to heat their homes with everything from fires to grills. And some were just wandering around looking for food that they did not have to cook. The Texas grid is run by ERCOT, E-R-C-O-T, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. And the fact that reliability is in its name is a sick joke at this point, but let's just move on from that. ERCOT is reliant on only the power it can generate since it is nearly entirely unconnected from other states. And I will add that there is some connectivity but not nearly enough for an occasion like this, especially as other states are seeing peak demands due to the winter weather, but it can't import any significant amounts of energy by design. So you have an isolated power grid, which is reliant only on itself, and it failed. The urge here for me to make a comparison to libertarian ideology is really, really obvious and strong right now because it fails in the same way for energy as it does for humans, but I'm going to resist that. ERCOT chose to cheap out in several ways. First, they relied on real-time scarcity model pricing. So when shit slid sideways, electrical prices soared to insane heights. It was routinely at $1,500 per kilowatt hour, and over some five-minute spans, it hit an astronomical $11,000 per kilowatt hour. Now, I know that maybe you're thinking, 
I don't even know what those numbers mean. Like how much is electricity per kilowatt hour normally? Well, the average annual rate for Texas, it would be about $25. $25 to 11000 dollars because these morons chose profits over life. The other major way that energy grids function is by utilizing what's called a capacity market auction. What happens here is that the energy providers decide three years ahead of time what price to pay people who actually generate the energy, which they will then sell when and if they need it. The generators themselves get paid even if some of that energy is not needed. Now, an ERCOT-style system can work well so long as nothing goes wrong and there are no energy spikes or systemic failures. Even worse than all of that, over the past decade, ERCOT reduced what they call a reserve margin, which is just basically how much extra energy they produce just in case. And they reduced it from 20% extra to 10% extra. And that limits even further what they can do if there is a sudden crisis. And that drop in that reserve margin, that was all about profits over people. The second way that ERCOT cheaped out in search of profits, and the one which had the most immediate and direct impact on Texas, was their reluctance to winterize their equipment. This caused natural gas pipes, valves, and pumps to freeze and prevented natural gas plants from producing electricity. It even shut down coal plants because equipment froze there as well. Hell, even a bunch of windmills froze, which is something to remember because we are going to revisit this shit about windmills a little bit later. ERCOT could have spent a little bit of money to winterize equipment by insulating things or installing warmers in equipment. But they decided to skimp on those things and risk the lives of Texans for a little more profit margin. Because of course they did, because this is how corporations work. It's baked directly into the product. This situation was not inevitable. There is nothing about these systems that makes them not work in the cold if you put a little thought into it. In New England, where I live, we don't lose all of our power if it gets cold. I have natural gas in my house right now and electricity. It's all good because the equipment is properly winterized. Shit, even Antarctica has windmills. It's not that hard to do. And meanwhile in Texas, one energy provider that goes by the name of Gritty actually told its customers to find a different provider because they were about to get massive bills. Yeah, even one corporation was embarrassed in this case. Oh, and before we move on from this, do you want to hear about one energy company that was not embarrassed? That would be a wonderful company called Comstock, which is most famous because its owner is Jerry Jones, who also owns the Dallas Cowboys football team. The CFO of Comstock, a man called Roland Burns, decided to hop into the spotlight to say the following. Quote, This week is like hitting the jackpot with some of these incredible prices. Frankly, we were able to sell at super premium prices for a material amount of production. End quote. Fucking jackals. Absolute jackals. And listen, I don't know how many times I need to repeat this or how many times I can repeat it without going mad, but these people do not care about you. And it's not like any of this is, you know, a once in a lifetime event. There have been a bunch of cold weather issues for Texas in the recent past, and at least two major ones like we are seeing today. One was in 1989, and the other was in 2011, and I found that with one Google search. The last one, in 2011, it killed people. And ERCOT did nothing with that lesson. They said, fuck it, let them die if it happens again. It'll cost money to save them. And yeah, they knew it would happen again. We all knew if we'd thought about it. Of course it would happen all over again. They just chose to sacrifice a certain amount of Texans every 15 years or so. Because it's cheaper. And then you have incredibly dishonest people. And I do want to make sure that we note that these people are actually dishonest and miscreants here. 
and not just stupid. So miscreants like this guy, absolute ghouls of human beings, they go out and tell the country that the issue that caused Texans to die was windmills. Yeah, yep. He actually said that the root cause of this crisis was windmills. His name is Governor Greg Abbott of Texas. Here he is on Fox News. This shows how the Green New Deal would be a deadly deal for the United States of America. Our wind and our solar got shut down, and, and they were uh, collectively more than 10 percent of our power grid. And that thrust Texas into a situation where it was lacking power in a statewide basis. It just shows uh, that fossil fuel is necessary uh, for the state of Texas, as well as other states, to make sure that we were, uh, will be able to heat our homes in the wintertime and cool our homes in the summertime. And here's some sound of another famed garbage bag of a human being and world-renowned liar, Tucker Carlson, making the same dishonest claims on that same network. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Happy Monday. Well, the Green New Deal has come, believe it or not, to the state of Texas. Last night, parts of Texas got to temperatures that we see in Alaska. In fact, they were the same as they were in Alaska. So global warming is no longer a pressing concern in Houston. We've solved that problem. The bad news is they don't have electricity. The windmills froze, so the power grid failed. Millions of Texans woke up to soil their water because with no electricity, it couldn't be purified. Windmills and other renewables, by the way, they make up around 10% of Texas's entire energy generation. So don't believe this nonsense. The culprit here is corporate greed and a moronic ideology which led into a mass disinvestment in Texas's energy infrastructure, which caused fossil fuel plants, which provide 90% of the energy in Texas, to freeze. Hell, even a nuclear reactor had to be shut down due to frozen equipment. So what is the point of all this? What is the realization? Well, the first thing I'm thinking about is that I should clip this Texas segment as part of our Is This Freedom series, because it covers a lot of similar notions, like the idea that being a loner is true freedom, or that being self-sufficient in good times means that you don't need to forge ties with your neighbors for when bad times come. Or that all government is bad. All collectivism is bad. That being alone is being free. Or even that paying a little less for electricity because markets or whatever is preferable to making sure that your systems will support your life if a brief ice storm sweeps through your area. And this infantile, depressing, and deeply incorrect notion of freedom killed Texans this week, just like it has in the past. And this ideology doesn't just spring from the ground. It is beaten to people's brains by ill-intentioned sociopaths like Jerry Jones and his CFO who are giggling about the profits they made even as this disaster grew. It's beaten into our brains by sociopaths like Ted Cruz, Texas senator, who espouses such nonsense as part of his daily life and then flees his constituents to bask on the beach in warm, sunny Cancun, while those he is charged to care for died in their homes and in their cars. Get these goons to winterize the equipment, Get these absolute psychos to connect their grid to the outside world. Get these pieces of human waste to prioritize people over profits. Take your state back. And that's it for this episode, everybody. Uh, I thank you for listening. And if you enjoy what you hear, it would be really helpful if you guys could rate and review on Apple. There will be a link in the description below. Uh, just, you know, if hit, hit those five stars. It takes one second to do. It's not that hard. Don't be lazy. It, it's, but honestly, it's really the single best thing that you can do to help spread the word and get the podcast heard by more people. And I would really appreciate it. Other than that, feel free to share, tell your friends, talk about it, whatever. Uh, you know, listen to the next episode. Keep listening. I love you guys. Thank you.